Hey, Retcon Raider here. With special thanks to the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible. Including but not limited to Matthew Smith, Revenant, Eloise, A Nerd in Warpaint, Dragon Matrix 7, Eerie V23, Excelsior, Goatlieb, Kazorm, Lima, Nathan Welch Jr., Thomas Pietkowski, Trip Hop and Skip, and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. And welcome back to Solasta, Lost Valley, as the adventure continues. And today we are setting our sights on wrapping things up here at the Ruined Temple. Which, at this point, I'm actually fairly certain is an old temple to Maasai, the Termarian goddess of luck and trickery. Hard to say how that might really tie into everything else, but it does feel like part of like a grander theme. We've got the Palace of Illusion right around the corner, signs that the Magister of Illusion was once based here somewhere. We've got those books about dragons that once ruled the Manicolan Empire disguised as elves. And the mysterious mask kicking around. And uh, Maasai does notably wear a charade-style mask. Anyway, we'll uh, see what we find at the end of this place. Maybe that'll help shed some light. But before we move on, we do have a bit of bookkeeping to take care of. We, uh, we are going to go ahead and swap out cloaks on Thygor. After giving it some thought, I feel like uh, he is, of course, the character we thrust in the path of danger the most frequently. So he would be the one who would probably most benefit from the massive defensive bonuses of a Cloak of Displacement. Not to mention, of course, the uh, added benefits of sort of negating the disadvantage that Reckless Attack would normally grant. Then his hand-me-down Cloak of Protection will go to Garvin, who I do still like to occasionally have mix it up in melee. You know, sometimes you just want to hit something with a magic club. Oh, and of course, you will also notice that we're back out at the entrance. We've got a level in the queue. Might as well get that knocked out. We're not hurting on food, and I think this is mostly just passive bonuses anyway. So it should just take a moment. All right, first things first, let's get those cloaks swapped. There we go, and now let's have a look at our level ups. Yeah, yeah, it looks to be pretty much nothing but passives. More hit points, boosted proficiency bonus, better spells, and Indomitable, which is basically just a once per day mulligan on savings throws. Not fantastic, but certainly not bad. I mean, I'm sure it'll come in handy. Our big get will be at level 10 when we finally gain that spell tyrant telekinetic push sort of deal. It's been a long time coming, but we're almost there. As for his spells, you know, I am pretty happy with what he's got, but I think we will go ahead and at least temporarily swap out Spider Climb. I like having it. It's fun, but it's also somewhat redundant. We've got Twinned Fly on Mora, and it would be nice to actually free up that third attunement slot on Garvin. Officially retire the times of opening. That said, uh, we may still pick Spider Climb back up in the future. I believe we do get new spell slots at 10 and 12, though I would have to double check that. Next up, we've got Thygor, who pulls hit points, boosted proficiency, and just more general damage while raging, both from brutal critical and from additional rage damage. Certainly nothing to sneeze at. Though, much, uh, much like Eben, his best ability comes at 10. That's when he'll be picking up rock solid and gaining huge defensive boosts in melee.
After that, we've got Garvin, more hit points, proficiency boosts, deadlier spells. And of course, uh, at level 10, Spiegel will complete his transformation into a spirit hit point battery. Certainly something to look forward to. We've been building up to that for a while. And he picks up two new spell slots, uh, which will not be Dark Vision or Conjure Animal. Instead, given that we now have access to level 5 spells, I'm thinking we'll just grab Greater Restoration and Mass Cure Wounds. Not spells I think we'll need on any sort of regular basis, but certainly ones that are good to have in our arsenal for emergency situations. Especially Greater Restoration, since uh, we have run into enemies in the past who've hit us with some pretty serious hit point drain. And Mora. Pretty much the same deal here. More hit points, higher proficiency bonus, better spells. And at 10, she picks up her third meta magic, which I'm still on the fence about. I'm not sure which one we're going to go with. In fact, uh, I'd say I'm entirely open to suggestions on that one, so feel free to weigh in in the comments if you'd like. I feel like we've already gotten plenty of mileage out of Twinned and, and Empowered. As for spells... Pretty happy with what we've already got. We're not going to unlearn anything. And we do gain access to 5th level spells. With Greater Restoration being our uh, bonus spell from our subclass. That leaves us with one slot to play with. And there are several options here that are pretty appealing for the sort of controller mage we've leaned Mora into. The real limiting factor here is that from here on out, we only have about four more spell slots to play with. Um, unless we decide to unlearn something else we've already picked. So we do have to be a bit more frugal about what we actually fill those slots with. Especially since we're not even seeing the level six spell list just yet. That said, I personally favor Hold Monster. I like Paralyzing Foes because we've got Thygore to take advantage of it. But there's a lot to be said for the sheer raw arcane firepower of Mind Twist, which is a fantastic one-and-done area-of-effect psychic attack with a stun chaser. So yeah, yeah, I'm thinking we'll grab Mind Twist now and then hold Monster at 10 or 11, and that'll leave us with two more slots to play with. And that's pretty much it. Like I said, mostly passives this time around, just a few spell selections. But I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy with all that. Let's get our buffs reset. Then we'll finish clearing this place out. Natura, Muto, Viribe. Muto, Viribe. Salasta, Abio, Clipe. And we are good to go. You know what? Let's, um, let's push up the left side this time. We'll fill in some gaps, see if we can work our way back around to the altar. Then finish filling in the center of the map. Oh, not locked. Interesting. Still not entirely clear on why we have this platform up here. The only thing I can imagine it was for was to see down into the hallway here. Which might imply there's a combat encounter? Or, you know, it's just for scenery and I'm really overthinking it. That's that's also entirely possible. Rock 
Right, so I think we can rule out combat encounter. Overthinking it is. A pilgrim? Intriguing. That's one of the weaker monsters guarding the exits to the valley and keeping everyone trapped here. It's interesting that we'd find some here. Okay, uh, these things burrow, so not much point in setting up spikes. We'll just nuke them, hit them hard and fast. I was hoping we'd have more clustered together, but that's fine. Looks like the rest are in the hallway across from us. Thigor on point. He'll pin these two down, try to lure the rest in. down. Oh, wow, that that's more than I thought there would be. Laren, fall back. Okay, those things should be gunning straight for Thigor since he's the closest target. No point in spikes. Let's get a Thunder Dome set up. The hope, of course, being that they'll cluster on Thigor, making it easy to hit several at once. Looks like one perpendicular to us on the right. Arcana Muto Viribe. Yeah, yeah, and we've got four back here. two down. And we will, of course, have Thygor move to intercept. Oh. 
I guess they uh, locked onto Mora after the heavy shelling. That might be a problem. Thorns are still an option. It looks like the uh, weaker beetles do not burrow. But it would be a shame to waste call lightning. Yeah, I, I think we're okay. We'll just get Garvin on defense. You know what? This might be getting out of hand. Let's buy ourselves some breathing room. Simply stunning. And that'll do it. A nice, clean victory. Yeah, aside from some slight dinging on Garvin, we, uh, we actually weathered that pretty well. The, uh, the layout of this place is starting to make slightly more sense. They obviously had these two starter encounters positioned so you'd encounter them first. The goblins on the right, the beetles on the left with a more challenging undead encounter tucked all the way in back. Arcana, 
Evo Malmus. Oh, we have a raised area. And that leads right back to the temple. Okay, yes, this is... This is all coming together quite nicely. Doom Spear. Plus one heavy crossbow. And studded leather of survival, which is... Plus two studded with an additional plus two on savings throws. So not bad. Requires yet another blood ruby. Not sure we're actually getting any more of those. Let's have a quick look at that spear. Plus two. Inflicts Doom Blade Cut, which is essentially 1d6 necrotic DOT, ends on save. I mean, that's not terrible, though it's also not much competition for the Warhammer we're already crafting. Might be a fun secondary slot weapon for range attacks, if we, uh, if we happen to find ourselves rolling in spare Blood Rubies. Hey, more loot. We'll take that. Oh, that's interesting. A rune. And that pretty much verifies that this is, in fact, an old temple of Maasai. Because that statue is exactly the same as the statue we saw back in the uh, shrine, just on a smaller scale. Interesting. So Maasai has an established presence in this valley, post-cataclysm but prior to current events. Is that just a red herring, or does that actually tie into everything that's going on here? Actually, I guess the most obvious answer would be that she's the one behind the masked, because she is a Termarian goddess meaning she would obviously have a vested interest in deposing both Oranetis and the Rebels' proposed leader, since both of them have ties back to the old Manicolin Empire, not Termarian. Hmm. Let's check that side tunnel. And there's tile number four. In a completely unlit and not at all ominous chamber. Better. Thank you, Evan. Um, okay. Gotta say, I was really expecting something slightly more dramatic, but I guess that's fine. 
Yeah, I'm assuming that uh, opened some sort of portal or chamber into this space here. That does feel like a pretty conspicuous empty spot. But uh, let's have a peek at the statues. That button must be for the doorway we just passed through. Hard to guess what that means exactly. Pick your preferred deity. You only have one chance. Choose wisely. Or not. Ah, I see. So this is a very basic puzzle. We've got... Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. We have all five Tamarian gods present and accounted for. But given that we've already been to the end of this hallway and we already saw that this is, in fact, a temple of Maasai, I'm going to say we should probably pick Maasai. Lady of Luck, please smile on us. Ooh, magic dagger. Thank you. Let's have a look at that thing. Cheater. Oh, wow. Uh, an enchanted dagger forged by priests of Maasai to fight giants and beasts. Plus two dagger. That also inflicts plus 3d6 damage on giants and beasts. Simple, but very effective for its declared purpose. Kind of a shame we don't really have a dedicated dagger wielder, though. Oh, wait, it's class restricted. And it requires attunement. I didn't notice that before. Oh, geez. Well, that does complicate things somewhat. So that means it has to go to either Thygor or Mora, Barbarian or Sorcerer. And it would require an attunement slot, which is not ideal. Especially since there's no guarantee we'll ever find ourselves facing any particularly daunting giants or beasts. We'll just have Mora hold on to it for now so we don't lose track of it. If nothing else, it is a nice keepsake. A shame, though. If we had a dedicated rogue or, or ranger, then that would really be a no-brainer. It's just not a great fit for our, our current... Somewhat unorthodox party. I assume this is just another puzzle marker. Hard to guess what that means exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see they cover their bases, in case someone came from the opposite direction. That's the shrine, which means we've fully outlined the complex. So that really just leaves the treasure room right at the center. And I guess this weird locked door in the old jail. We tried opening it, but it appears to be pick and knock proof. So I'm not sure we can actually open that at all, unless there's a concealed button somewhere, or a key, or something that we have just not found yet.
which really just leaves the treasure room. So let's go check that out. Who knows? Maybe we'll find a key in there. Lights up. Forgot to reset that after we rested. Oh. I really thought this would lead us to that barred door. Um... Aha! Clever. Gotcha. So maybe there are more hidden buttons around that I just didn't notice. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to give this place another once over off screen just to be absolutely certain. Oh, nice. Okay, so we do have a, a trigger zone now in front of the mysterious runes. Which, you know, uh, given the close proximity to the secondary campsite, does strongly imply we are indeed walking into some sort of boss fight. That's pretty much Dungeon Design 101. Okay, here we go. Okay, again, less dramatic than I was expecting, but that does indeed appear to be a room full of treasure. Ah, I see. Well, yes, I can see how that might complicate things somewhat. Oh, mutant giant ape. That's one of the things Ornettis wanted. All right, let's tuck Lairon out of the way. As we recall from way back when, these guys like to throw boulders around. But honestly, given that we've got the drop on them and that they're so tightly clustered to begin with, I feel like this is going to be a pretty underwhelming final battle. We'll slap down spike growth. That should take out most of them on approach, honestly. Oh, shoot. I was not expecting that to actually start the fight. But I guess I pushed it up a bit too close to the big guy. Fair enough. I think we're still in pretty good shape here. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, we're... We are absolutely fine. The mutant gorilla is the only unknown, but the rest of these guys will all tear themselves to shreds on that thorn field. Fireball out. Lovely. Mora, could you please pick these guys off before they get bolder? about it. I'm sure we're fine. nine damage you say I I would be horrified if not for the fact that that landed on Spiegel our one expendable party member <laughs> sorry Spiegel hey look at that Lairin's helping. She contributed. And down it goes. Thygor may have struck the final blow, but I think we all know how this really went. Twas beauty that killed the beast. Thank you, Lairin. Couldn't have done it without you. Probably. Okay, okay. A bit of a lackluster final battle, but I think that might be it. It does look like we've still got some empty space here, but um, that might just be a quirk of the map making software.
Eben. Oh, did he... Did he disarm it? Uh, Mora? Huh. Okay. Uh, more crafting ingredients, more valuables. <laughs> 10,000 gold. Well, all right then. Cloud Diamond, Magic Dagger. Would be nice to get more stuff we can actually use, but we'll take it. We'll see what this one does. Ah, a lowly plus one. Not terribly exciting after the literal legendary relic we uncovered earlier, but... Oh, wait, no, no, I can't. I can't do that. She actually needs a free hand to cast. Oh, magic hide. That would be nice for Garvin. Ah, uh, Bracers of Archery. I was hoping those were Bracers of Defense, but fair enough. Oculus. And plus two hide armor, which we can indeed use. Because Garvin is currently rocking plus one hide, which also grants him the the redundant ability to speak druid slang. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice solid upgrade for Garvin. Bumps him up to 19 AC. That's respectable. And that looks to be a plus two mace. Is that it? Huh. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm certainly not complaining. There's some nice solid upgrades there. Not to mention 10,000 gold, but I was really, uh, I was really hoping for more, I guess. Arcana Evo Malmis. The massive pile of magic items we found back in the shrine of, uh... Maasai really set the bar unreasonably high. And, yeah, I have no idea what the deal with this door is. We didn't find a button. We didn't find a key. Maybe there's something hidden somewhere around the temple. We do have, we do still have some conspicuous empty spaces here, but again, that could just be a fluke of how the, the mapping software works. Hmm. All right, let's, uh. Obviously, we're not going to do a complete sweep while I'm recording. That stuff I can handle off screen, but uh, I am going to give this place another once over just to be sure. For now, though, let's uh, pull back to the forge camp. We'll dump all of our vendor trash and maybe pick up another item or two. And uh, I think we're at a good place to call it. Man, so a Temple of Maasai. 
You know, the more I think about it, the more it makes sense. Um, I was thinking that the the masked, who are almost certainly servants of Maasai, I was thinking the masked were working against the forge because we encountered Samco so early, and obviously we've spent a lot more time working with the forge than with the uh, the rebels. Natura Devo, Oculus. But in retrospect, it now seems pretty obvious that the uh, the masked are actually trying to prevent the rebels from really gaining any traction in their war on Oranetis, but at the same time, they're also working against Oranetis. They have spies conspicuously placed in all three of those specific factions, while they seem to have instead completely ignored the people. At least as far as we've seen. Maybe we just haven't advanced that particular quest chain far enough. I do wonder, though, what sets the masked and the people apart. Because in theory, they both share the same general goal. The people the people represents a conglomerate of non-elven citizens, the, the oppressed and downtrodden, who obviously have a vested interest in not just returning to oppressive elf rule. So why would the mask not work with them, or at least parallel to them? Maybe what sets them apart is that the masked aren't as altruistic. It did stress that Maasai is a chaotic goddess. Maybe they're making a power grab. Maybe taking down Oranetis and or the rebels isn't just about preventing another elven rule. Maybe they're trying to install themselves as the leaders instead. I don't know. I guess we can always just investigate further. It is a little silly to speculate at this point, given that um, given that we are right on the cusp of turning against the Dominion, which would allow us to finally progress the quest chains for the Rebels and the Masked. So I'm sure we'll know soon enough what they're really up to. That said, uh, yeah, I feel like we've hit a good stopping point here. We're past time. We've completed our main adventure for the day. We found a boatload of treasure. And we hit level 9. Just uh, three more until we hit level cap. So yeah, yeah, we'll hit the pause button for now. I'll uh, go do another quick pass through the temple just to, just to satiate my curiosity, if nothing else. And uh, we will pick up here next time. As we swing by Oranetis' palace one last time, just to drop off that monkey head. And then set our sights on Felig's outpost. It is well past time to start burning some bridges. See you then. And remember, although I do love playing Solasta Lost Valley, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official social media feeds, or the official store pages. And if you'd like to help support the channel, then feel free to push the buttons that do the things, or maybe even check out the Patreon. Links are in the description. Hard to guess what that means exactly.